Hello everyone, you're all very welcome to a postgraduate open day hosted by Queen's University in Belfast. My name is Audrey Carvel and I present programmes for the BBC and for RTE. I live in Dublin now, but I worked in Belfast for many, many years and I have wonderful, happy memories of a very vibrant, international and very friendly city. Today, we are going to demonstrate to you the world-class quality of education that is on offer at Queen's University and show you why it needs to be top of your list when you are considering where to pursue your education. Queen's will entice you with quality and excellence. It will give you the opportunity to not only further your own education, but to allow you to provide a wider contribution to the world through that education. And we will demonstrate that very clearly over the next hour. You will get an opportunity to speak directly to those at the very heart of the postgraduate study at Queen's University. Deans and senior educators will be on hand to answer and explain anything you need to know about postgraduate research and postgraduate taught courses. And we also have a very special guest for you in around 45 minutes, so stay with us, you will not want to miss that. Before that, let us take a look at what Queen's University education will offer you. Let's experience Queen's. <music> So that is what awaits you at Queen's University. So let's meet our guests today and they're going to introduce themselves. Hello everyone, my name is Margaret Pro Vice Chancellor for Graduate Studies at Queen's and Dean of our Graduate School. And when I'm not doing that, I'm also Professor of Intercultural Communication. Hi everyone, <clears throat> I am Helen McCarthy. I uh, hold the Chair of Nanomedicine in the School of Pharmacy and I'm also the Dean of Postgraduate Strategy at Queen's University. Hello, I'm Dahi Makshihi. I'm a Director of the Northern Bridge Doctoral Training Partnership in Arts and Humanities, and I'm Professor of Law and Innovation. Hello everyone, I'm Karen Morrison, the Dean of Education in the Faculty of Medicine, Health and Life Sciences, and Professor of Neurology here at Queen's. Hello, I'm David Rooney, a professor in chemical engineering and also dean for internationalization and reputation in the Faculty of Engineering and Physical Sciences. So some of the top educators at Queen's University joining us today to tell us all about their courses and to answer whatever questions you have. We will also have a number of 
current postgraduate students at Queen's University and they will be along later to describe their courses, to describe what life is like studying at Queen's and what it is like to live in Belfast. So we're going to start with looking at each of the faculties and discussing the courses that are on offer, both through taught and research courses. And Karen, can I begin with you? Would you take us through some of the courses that are on offer in your faculty? Yes, thank you. So I'm here representing Medicine, Health and Life Sciences. So within our faculty, we've got really vibrant programmes within the School of Medicine, Dentistry and Biomedical Science, particularly programmes such as those in public health, really trying to dig down into the causes of population health and how we might intervene there and also extensive programmes in bench science there. We've then got the programmes in the School of Biological Sciences, so that links with uh, programmes in food security or in lots of programmes to do with ecological sustainability across a wide variety. Then we've got pharmacy with an exciting uh, master's programme in industrial pharmaceutics. And of course, nursing and midwifery is a huge part of our faculty with programmes there, particularly aimed at those in professional courses delving deeper into postgraduate study. Terrific. And we'll explore some of those in, in more detail in just a moment. Karen, thank you. Uh, Dahi, what about your faculty? Well, the Faculty of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences is a large and a broad faculty where we see some creative areas such as poetry uh, or music. We see professional areas including social work, education, accounting and some of the familiar humanities areas such as English and, and history. Uh, and taught and research options are available across our faculty and we've recently added uh, new programmes in geopolitics, in law and technology and in international public policy. We participate in a range of doctoral research partnerships uh, which offer uh, excellent opportunities not just for a researcher to work on their own project uh, but also to receive research methods training uh, and take their skills to the next level. David, will you give our audience an idea of what's on offer in your faculty? Well, engineering and physical sciences covers a, a very wide range of diverse topics, everything from astrophysics right through to zero carbon. Uh, all of this is really aimed at building on the research strengths of the academics within the faculty and across the university in general. And we use these then to build a number of different courses at the postgraduate taught and research level to support students in terms of their ambitions and their career opportunities going forward. Um, there's lots of different ways that we could describe those courses. One way, for example, would be to consider the way that they teach us how we interact with things like the physical world, how we develop new types of materials and engineer those materials to do the things we want, how we can also link into psychology and understanding our interaction with health and really trying to understand how we can use psychology to help rehabilitate people and control disease. We have the interactions with the environment in terms of environmental engineering, and we also have interactions with our digital world as well, including things like software design and advanced cybersecurity. But we can also look at courses in terms of how they add depth or breadth or give students an opportunity to really take their career in a completely new direction. We can have courses which are, we do have courses which include, for instance, a master's in architecture, which allows people to look at sustainable practice and design and new technologies. Uh, courses which add business and entrepreneurial skills onto mechanical engineering or courses which allow students, for instance, to undertake new challenges in software engineering or switch completely to, for instance, psychological sciences. All of these courses are employability focused. They're all delivered by staff within the Russell Group University. All very exciting. It certainly is. It, it is a terrific range of subjects and opportunities for students. And Karen, maybe you would pick on um, a few of the courses within your department that have been successful, that have been popular, uh, and perhaps look ahead to some courses that are coming on stream. Yes, indeed. Thanks. So um, some of our really popular courses I'm going to highlight here are courses in public health, where we take students from across the globe and really provide 
innovative postgraduate taught courses so that they can get background in their discipline and then explore in depth through projects guided by uh, staff who have really been embedded within the field of public health, not only at an academic level, but also many of whom have worked with NGOs or other charitable organisations across the globe. Other courses of interest I might mention, for example, in biological sciences, where a lot of our emphasis is on sustainability goals, and um, the courses that we have, for example, in leadership for sustainable development, Again, courses taught by leading researchers who are experts in their field, but then embedding in many, many placement opportunities, um, both with uh, commercial and then with other partners based on those programmes. So those are highly popular programmes. Other programmes that we'll be developing then this year and will be expanding this year, just to highlight some of our really innovative programmes in advanced professional practice within nursing and midwifery, expanding the areas in which our courses there really take professionals to explore um, increased areas of the research uh, opportunities and leadership opportunities. Terrific, thank you, Karen. And Dahi, uh, from your perspective, what are the courses that you uh, feel particularly strongly about and perhaps ones that are coming on stream? This is a really great time to be a postgraduate student and there's so much world-leading research happening at the university which brings staff and students to Belfast from around the world. So if you take, for example, our master's programme in conflict transformation and social justice, um, it attracts students with really deep and rich experience in non-governmental organisations, uh, the United Nations work in uh, post-conflict and transitional societies and that's all happening in a context of uh, research that is uh, cuts across the disciplines in our faculty and indeed reaches beyond it. Um, we also see our programmes adapt to the, the changing workplace. So uh, if we look at our uh, programme in media and broadcast production, which blends theory and practice, but it also adds to the facilities we've invested in, in editing and production, with everything from podcasting to virtual reality. And so across the disciplines that we're offering uh, programmes in, we're constantly looking for new ways to reflect the conditions that our students are going to go on and live and work in, but to put that in the context of research centres and the excellence of our staff. And Margaret, it's so fascinating listening to all three talk about their courses because they really are at the sharp edge of where we are at now in terms of our working world. But you also have to be ready for the jobs of the future, the jobs that don't even exist yet. Absolutely, and I think as our colleagues have said, what Queen's has done in the last number of years is really to look very, very closely at our portfolio of master's programmes, to look at the research environment that we offer our students, and really to make sure that that is being adaptable and responsive to what is needed outside the university. There's no point in our sitting talking to one another within the university and not engaging with the world outside. So as all of my colleagues have said here, our programmes are based on changing social needs, changing economical, economic needs, changing health needs. They're absolutely co-designed and co-created with industry partners, with partners in policy sector and NGO sector and so on. And this has been a really conscious effort on the part of Queen's to recognise that what we want to create through our postgraduate environment is not just high level thinkers and high level scholars, but people who really are able to make a difference in the world that they live in. So all of our courses, as colleagues have said, have this um, practical skills dimension embedded in them. They have the engagement of employers um, from all different sectors in the delivery of the courses. And then we'll talk a little bit more as the hour goes on about the graduate school, but the ways in which the graduate school is also part of that ethos of preparing people, not just to be experts in their subject areas, but actually to be able to put that into practice through leadership, communication, business skills, entrepreneurial skills, uh, and so on. So I would say that I think there's a theme that runs through everything that my colleagues and faculties have said, and that theme is about ensuring that we have graduates who are not just great thinkers, but who are actually able to take that out and do and make change with that. And I think that's what defines our postgraduate community. And Helen, will you talk to us about the value of a master's degree? Because there is a perception sometimes among some people that you can do a master's in almost anything you want these days, and perhaps it may devalue a master's degree. What, what are your thoughts on that? 
Well, as the colleagues have said today, it really is about <clears throat> making you future ready. So what society needs and what employers need changes dramatically. Um, we've seen a classic example across the, the world over the, la the last you know, 18 to 24 months on what is required. And so I think a master's program can help to give you the confidence and the skill set that you need to adapt and change to whatever is required of you. And employers really like that. In fact, over 80% of our graduates have said that having a master's degree has had a significant benefit whenever it comes to them getting employment. I think the other thing of note is that we don't sit in silos. So our colleagues here from all the faculties and, and the graduate school, we don't do uh, masters uh, in a one-dimensional way. So we bring in all of the, the various topics that they've talked about, so you have that discipline excellence. But also, we also bring together people that are potentially doing masters in uh, engineering with people that are doing masters in social conflict. We give them the opportunity to engage and communicate. And I think that's really important because as you know, when you go out into society and the workplace, you have to engage with all different types of people and also all different types of skill sets. So you have to be ready to adapt to whatever is put in front of you. And that's something that we very much believe in, that you learn in a multi-dimensional way. Will you jump in there, David, and apply that to your own faculty, how that works in terms of the interdisciplinary nature of some of the courses that are on offer at master's level? Uh, there are a whole range of courses which are very interdisciplinary. As, you know, we, we, as a faculty, we are trying to address society's challenges and to understand how things are happening, and why things are happening, and what we might be able to do to change it in order to make it better. That involves working across multiple disciplines. Sustainable development goals and, and areas around sustainability in general are very, are a prime example really of, of the need to have multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary thinking. It's not just simply about technology, it's about how people adapt to that technology, how they behave with it, how they basically use it on a day-to-day -day basis, how it fits in with their lives and their cultures around the world. And so that type of thinking needs to be brought in on top of engineering degrees or on top of science degrees by bringing in communication skills, by bringing in policy, by bringing in behaviour. So lots of different transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary activities across multiple programmes on offer within EPS and within my colleagues. Faculties, yes, yeah, super, thank you. And uh, Karen, in terms of postgraduate research, what opportunities exist within your faculty for that? What opportunities are, Audrey, there are just so many across the scope of the programmes that we offer. I haven't really mentioned the really detailed um, and vast range of programmes that we have within the School of Medicine, dealing with molecular biology, uh, systems biology, linking through to human disease, all the work that we do on infectious disease, the work on virology, clearly very topical at the moment, linking through then to newer courses in biostatistics and bioinformatics, all with the ultimate aim of improving health. I've mentioned earlier the public health programmes. Again, tackling, looking at health from a completely different side of the spectrum, but again, with that ultimate aim. Within biological sciences, again, there's a huge range of research programmes. I'm thinking of the, one, the programmes that we have in our Institute for Global Food Security, which encompass a range of approaches to trying to secure and develop that area of research alongside those in more biologically focused areas, again, centered around sustainability goals. So huge research, um, a huge range of research and different types of project. So something for everyone and also scope for you within your research to explore different aspects of approaches to the research topic that you choose. And Dahi, in the Faculty of Arts, Humanities, Life Sciences, there is a perception, perhaps wrongly, that um, people who do PhDs uh, do it to stay in academia. Is that a true perception or what are the opportunities within your faculty? 
It's both really. Uh, I mean, the the PhD has changed over the years, and we now offer through our our flagship doctoral training partnerships for Arts and Humanities, Northern Bridge, um, and Social Sciences, Nine, uh, funding and training opportunities. Uh, these are not just about the thesis or the project that someone is doing, but also the skills they will develop as a researcher, the training they will receive in a whole range of research methods, including those maybe long established in their discipline, but also uh, uh, newer ones. And some will go on to academic uh, careers, and we've seen great successes in that. Uh, but the, the types of thinkers that come out of doctoral programmes in our faculty, and indeed in all of the faculties, um, will have uh, a whole range of chances and opportunities in the public and private sector. Uh, what we do in our graduate school, and there's nothing quite like our graduate school anywhere in these islands and indeed further afield, uh, is where we are facilitating and encouraging researchers to, to think not just of their own project, but about the contribution that they can make through their project, through their practice, um, and through their identity as researchers, entrepreneurs, and thinkers to the wider world and to the world that we're living in. So doing a PhD, right now there's so many uh, opportunities out there and there are so many possible topics that demand that level of attention and doing it in uh, a university with a reputation for its research um, makes, a, makes a huge difference. You're working alongside world-leading experts, visiting speakers, students who are doing cutting-edge projects and it's such a great chance for somebody who wants to do a PhD right now. Brilliant. David, in your faculty what are the opportunities for postgraduate research? Again, a very diverse range of topics. If you're interested in sustainable energy, we have people who, who specialize in that. If you're interested in composite materials, if you're interested in what do you do next with a, a wind turbine blade, if you're interested in environmental engineering, in, in sensors for pharmaceutical analysis, if you are interested in child development psychology, we, we have expertise in all of these different areas. So lots of different things that are aimed at addressing those societal challenges, training people up to be critical thinkers and really taking through and benefiting their own career in the future. That critical thinking is so important, Margaret, as you were mentioning. And it sounds listening to all of you that a PhD is something that everyone can consider doing. Absolutely. I mean, I think just interesting hearing colleagues talking about the range of, of careers that our postgraduates go into following a PhD. I mean, the statistics are very interesting because I think there is a perception that a PhD is taking you into an academic career only. In arts, humanities and social sciences, it's about 35 to 40 percent of our PhD students who go into academic careers. In our other faculties, in medicine, health and life sciences and in engineering and physical sciences, it's actually about 13 to 15 percent. So the reality is that a PhD is not just about preparing you for the kinds of jobs that we all do. I mean, it's a great job that we all do and we would all want people to do more of that. But there are so many other ways that you're prepared beyond that. And I think that is where the unique contribution or the unique partnership between our schools, our faculties, our research in institutes and the graduate school comes into play because we're absolutely focused on the recognition that this is not just about preparing you for an academic career. And even if it is, let's face it, academic careers are also now very focused on impact. It's about understanding how big, how big complex organisations work. It's about understanding how we communicate, how we work across, how we influence, how we work across disciplinary boundaries. So whether it's an academic context or beyond, the Queen's context is absolutely about preparing you for that. Um, Helen might have other thoughts on, on how we, we manage this as, a, as an institution. Yeah, I mean, I think as well as that, when you think about research, it is about new ideas and searching for the answers to a question. And that often brings about new findings. Some expected, mostly unexpected. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, sometimes you get PhDs that are full of negative results, but there's no such thing as a negative result. It's a mindset of new learnings that you can take forward. I think as well as that, um, Queen's is very well known for its entrepreneurial skills and Cubis which is the spin-outs from Queen's University. And the majority of the spin-outs from Queen's University are built upon intellectual property that many of our research students have been part of. And they have um, you know, really been integral in helping uh, a lot of different uh, topics, areas, um, manufacture of medicines, whatever, become actual 
companies that can then infiltrate across the globe and, and have a huge impact there. So it, this idea that we're stuck in our ivory towers and we're not connected to the rest of society is actually absolute nonsense. We are very much listening to what society needs, working across and taking the outputs that we have and actually making them translate to real world impact. Dahi, would you say people need a PhD or is a master's enough? Well, people come to us for all sorts of different reasons. So, um, you know, some students who are doing a master's degree are thinking of going on to doctoral study and therefore they're, they're identifying a specialism. It might build upon what they've studied or worked on in the past or it might be a uh, change of direction and uh, students doing a master's programme get a chance to do some research or some uh, some practice based work which may serve to be very useful in their future careers or as a showcase of what they can do but it can also then be uh, uh, that important stepping stone to, to greater work at, uh, at doctoral level and even at doctoral level um, we see uh, researchers coming to us after significant uh, professional and practical experience and so what we try to do in our programs uh, both at masters and doctoral level across the university is to offer different uh, different ways in so that can include uh, part-time study that can involve conversion courses or changes of direction it can involve people doing research that re that's related to their professional context um, and so the the university experience at postgraduate level is about taking ownership of your own doing things that might feel surprising or challenging and that's that's why we want to do it. Exactly and that's where we're heading to next I suppose when you when you have finished your postgraduate work in terms of employability. Karen what would you say does it make you more employable to have a master's or a PhD? I, I would say absolutely and emphatically yes even if your master's or your indeed your um, you know, thesis isn't particularly in an area that on the surface seems directly related to what you're ultimately going to end up doing. I myself have a very solid science background. I'm a molecular biologist by training. I was trained to do that. I was trained in genetic analysis. But yet those skills that the space of doing a master's or a PhD in terms of organizing your own time, thinking about a subject in detail, really exploring the intricacies of a subject so that you truly understand what's going on. That thought process, that intellectual process will stay with you forever, no matter which area of, um, well, I was going to say of life, but so it's careers, but it's of life. And I so commend master's PhD study as a life enhancing skill there will be times, just as been mentioned, when you get negative results or no results, actually, which are sometimes worse than negative results. But you can still build on those and how you move forward. The other thing is that when you come to do research somewhere like Queen's, you are not on your own. There is a sea of students. There is a mass of staff here. And so you are learning to interact with people from all over the globe, yes, even here at Queen's, we have people from all over. And those sorts of skills are so useful for getting on with life and what life throws at you, mm. even in our professional programs. And I'm so keen to you know, encourage people to come to a multidisciplinary university where you get exposed to a broad range you don't have to stick rigidly to the subject that you sign the line on. You can talk to the others of us here. Yeah, exactly. And David, how does it help you get a better job? It, it, it certainly does um, help you get a better job. How is because if we take a, take, take a step back, a, a, an undergraduate degree is a very good foundation. A master's degree then allows you to specialise in, in specific areas which are of value to you and of interest to you. And a PhD would give you complete ownership over that. And, and that depth in, and, and that ownership really does help to direct your career and make you stand out in conversations with employers and elsewhere and other people and really help to, to boost your chances of securing a successful job in something that you really want to do. And just to echo my, my colleagues' comments, 
you know, we have to choose where do you want to do that? Where are you going to get all those skills, not only within the academic environment, but elsewhere? You have to choose not only the right people to work with, but also the right environment in which to work in in order to allow you to demonstrate that or to give you those opportunities. And I think Queen's is a fantastic place to come and do that. Tahi, are those links in place between the university and industry on the outside to, to make that pathway smoother for uh, postgraduate students? Absolutely. Uh, many of our postgraduate programmes are specifically designed for those who are um, changing direction. And so they, uh, the, they're starting on that journey towards, for instance, uh, a new qualification or a new context in which to work. Uh, others, though, are, say, designed for, for people who are working and wish to uh, to gain greater experience in a particular area and so they may well be, uh, be coming to us part-time or doing some of their their project work uh, in the context in which they're already working and we build upon our strengths so for instance um, the faculty has uh, a great experience and links in creative industries which uh, through which we link into the cultural gallery and museum sector, to broadcasters, to the really exciting startup culture that's in place in uh, Northern Ireland. And programmes also uh, work with partners across the, the globe. So our master's programme in Global Borders involves placements at ports and airports. So students can see how the theory they're learning in the classroom uh, fares out in the, in the world, but can also then uh, reconcile some of those interesting challenges and uh, and questions that they will face uh, when they go forward. So we do try to build all of that in and we reflect um, feedback from employers. So for instance, the new programme in law and technology reflected uh, comments from the legal profession that the, the world of law uh, was changing and was being affected by technological and data issues in lots of ways. The same with our programme in business analytics over in our uh, management school. So we take soundings and we do try to ensure that what we're doing um, uh, reflects not just today's world, but the challenges of the next 10, 20, 30 years. Well, that's it, Margaret. And I'm thinking of the pandemic and the effect of it in the last year on jobs and on people's work and their career. And they may be at a point now where they think their existing job is gone and they have to retrain, re-educate. How easy is that going to be if they choose Queen's? I think that's something that we are very attuned to. I mean, I would say that just in the base of everything my colleagues have been saying also about, you know, what's the difference between the undergraduate and the masters and how can that facilitate people changing direction when it comes to, for example, a changing job environment at the pandemic. I, mean, I think what separates the undergraduate from the masters is that in the masters you're moving into a place where you are being trained to think differently, trained to be a disruptive thinker. Um, and, and to challenge, and I mean, Helen was talking about researches, it's about the constant search, it's about things not always working out and how do you adjust how you're flexible in that context. That's what makes the masters different and I think that's what also makes our masters students better prepared to be flexible and agile in a, an environment where we don't know what the future of jobs looks like. I mean, even pre-COVID, we were discussing uh, the future of work and people are saying, we don't know what the future of work is in 10, 15, 20 years. What will be automated? What won't be? What jobs will still exist? COVID has accelerated so much of that and we've had to think really fundamentally about how we, how we operate professionally. All the more reason why we need postgraduate students who are disruptive thinkers, who are not just people who know stuff, but actually know how to respond to be agile to change. And that's, I think, what the Queen's experience has really focused on. I think we have been ahead of the curve in the last five years and thinking about how we create an environment where that is what happens. And we create that environment by making sure that our students are being um, challenged by industry experts. And not just our students, our staff as well. I mean, Helen mentioned Ivory Tower. Our staff cannot, we, none of us can anywhere uh, be in an ivory tower anymore. We have to have the challenge from industry. We also have to have the challenge from people coming in from different work environments, from different professional environments, national and international environments. So to come back to that original question of what does this mean for people who are maybe coming in from having worked in one environment for a long time, that's what makes the Queen's postgraduate experience work. The fact that we do have people who've got 20, 30, 40 years of experience in a very different professional environment perhaps, and they're coming in to work alongside a student who's just come out of their undergraduate degree. That melting pot is what makes the conditions right for developing disruptive thinkers who are being 
uh, given access to different sorts of perspectives. So I think there's something about our culture generally, which is around the interdisciplinarity, the transdisciplinarity, the skills dimension that the graduate school brings, as well as our courses. Um, but also, quite simply, the fact that we offer a lot of practical support too. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the big ideas around how we think differently, but on a very practical level, if we have a student who's coming back into a study after 10, 15, 20 years, we have a lot in our schools, but also in our graduate school, which is about helping people understand this is what an academic essay looks like. This is what research methods are. This is what, on a very basic level, this is how you engage with critical sources, make sure you're using them appropriately. So I think for those who are thinking about a return to study, it can feel quite daunting, but know that there is a very practical uh, foundation available to you in terms of skills and study skills. There's also a real recognition that your different perspective is bringing something to the table that we absolutely value and cherish. And we don't want everyone in our seminar rooms to be the same and have the same backgrounds. Be so I would say, don't hesitate. Don't You've hesitate. got all the support that you need, yeah. um, as well as lots of social groups which are very much focused on people who have children, have caring responsibilities. So you've got the whole support network. Well, that's it. Uh, that's important, Karen, isn't it? Because it can be quite intimidating for someone who has been in work for 10, 15, 20 years to, to leave that not of their own choice and back into academic life. Um, absolutely. And I'm going to focus here on our programmes in nursing and midwifery, where our master's programmes are aimed at people who have been working in the field often for many years and the prospect of coming back to an academic environment, which they may have left a long time ago, can be daunting. But absolutely, the programmes are geared towards inclusivity and making sure that students are empowered to succeed on the programmes. Helen, we're going to talk briefly about the graduate school itself. It's a tremendous building. I visited it a few years ago. I'm so impressed. It's beautiful. Anyone who is able to study there is very, very lucky indeed. Will you talk to us about the philosophy behind it? Sure. So the philosophy of the graduate school is really a blend of ideas. So there's no discrete, this is our philosophy and we're sticking to it. The way that we work is we want to make each graduate student future ready. So when a graduate student comes to us, we take them on a journey. And my journey is going to be different from Margaret's journey, different from Karen's journey, David's, Dahi's. But the point is we assess each graduate student and we see what are you really good at? What are you not so good at? So, for example, you can have the best set of results and research idea in the world, but if you can't communicate it, you're going to be in a bit of trouble by the time you finish. So we have a look to see everybody's strengths and weaknesses, and then we take them on that journey. And the idea behind that journey is we want you to be an excellent communicator. We want you to be able to critically think. Uh, we also want you to be an innovator. We also want you to be ready for whatever the future throws at you. And as well as getting soft skills from the graduate school, you can also get professional qualifications. You can have group sessions, you can have one-to-one, -one, but basically whatever you need to make you resilient. And you asked Margaret the question there on, you know, really kind of what, what, what sets you apart. And what I would say what sets you apart is when you come out of the graduate school, coupled with the unbelievably disciplined skills that you will get. You will come out reliant on yourself. And that's what we want. We want you to be reliant on yourself. So whenever you go out, it doesn't matter what you work in. It doesn't matter if you start off in, in neuroscience and you end up in sonic arts. You are ready for it and you can rely on yourself and you have the confidence to go, do you know what? I can do this. And that's really the philosophy of the graduate school. I'm looking at Margaret because she actually is the boss of the graduate <laughs> school, not me. But, you know, that's what we want our graduate students to go. I can rely on myself. And if there's something I can't do, I'm going to go and find help to find out how to do it. Well, you've passed with flying colours. I think, yeah, top marks. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret, what are the benefits of a standalone graduate school? Because I think Queen's is one of very few standalone graduate schools in these parts. 
Yes, our model is, is different and actually you can see now in the background a beautiful picture of our graduate school. Um, it was originally the University Library. We recently celebrated 150 years of the building but it is now this wonderful place for our postgraduates and it is absolutely that blend of all of the kind of rich intellectual heritage that the building suggests but a very, very forward-looking approach. I think what's different about what we do at Queen's is that our graduate school is for the entire university. It's for students in arts, humanities and social sciences, engineering, and in medicine, health and life sciences and that is very unusual. A lot of universities in the UK will have a graduate school associated with a faculty um, and very often it's not a, a physical space either um, whereas actually this is on a very practical level a beautiful space where our students can come together not so much recently, it's been more virtual, but they can study in their private spaces, they can come together in training and development opportunities. But I think the key one for me and what differentiates it is the extent to which we have someone from architecture talking to someone from theology. We have someone from pharmacy talking to a historian. And I think that's, it's partly where the really interesting conversations start to happen. It's partly where that sort of disruptive thinking that we're talking about were happening. I mean, Helen and I work very closely together. My background is originally in French studies, a very traditional literary scholar. Helen is uh, nanomedicine. We have a lot of conversations where Helen says to me, what's the point of what you do? Uh, I'm not in the nicest possible way. I'm not quite <laughs> as politely as that. And I say the same thing to her. We're putting our students in that environment as well, where they're having to say, yeah, this is why what I do is important. And this is why you need to understand what I do and how we can work together to solve the sorts of t um, social problems and global problems and challenges that we're talking about. I think that's what's really key. On a very practical level, it's a beautiful space that is for our postgraduate students alone. It sets them apart. But I think what is also there is the fact that it is absolutely what I call long-term interdisciplinary or not, uh, sorry, long-distance interdisciplinarity, because it's not just about talking within a faculty, it's really across the board. And that's often quite uncomfortable and our students struggle with it, but it's often what they're calling out with at the end is saying, yeah, that was really great being in a leadership program where I had to engage with someone from physics when I'm an English literature student. Let's go through some questions because some of our audience has questions uh, for you. So I'll, I'll put some of them to you in the few minutes that we have. Um, Helen, I'll start with this one to you. I am currently furloughed due to the pandemic and I'm considering returning to education to undertake a master's. I am nervous about returning to education, was wondering what measures there are in place to help me transition into postgraduate study. And I'm concerned too that I might be the only mature student in the class. I'm pleased to say that that's a relatively easy question to answer. Um, what I would say is don't be nervous because you've already taken the first step by even thinking about it. And, and that's the biggest thing is, is to think about it. The second thing I would say is that over almost a third of our graduate students are over the age of 30, which you know, apparently people view as old. I personally don't because I'm well over 30. Um, but what I would say is that we can provide in the graduate school, as well as the school specific programs, we can provide all of the skills you might need. So that can, be, that can range from, you know, how do I write? How do I write scientifically? Um, how do I write creatively? Uh, how do I reference? Um, how do I present? How do I engage with my academic peers? How do I network? All of these things, we run courses every semester. We run coffee sessions, we, a lot of different opportunities. So do not stress about that. Basically, we will identify what are your areas that you need to improve upon, because everybody has to improve on certain areas, mm -hmm. and we'll help you do that. I would also say that for our students that, that come, their relationship with their academic supervisor, especially in PhDs, is very important. And so one of the things um, that will happen as well is frequently PhD supervisors might come to us and say, my student could really do with some help in X and we will do our best to facilitate that as well. Yeah. So Great. basically, don't worry, you've done the first step, come and talk to us and it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Great. And um, Margaret, I have an offer to study a master's course starting in September 2021. What is the likelihood that the course will be taught on campus? And if so, what measures will be in place to ensure the student, the safety of students? Yeah, a very important question. Um, I think for the first thing I would say is that we're absolutely committed to ensuring that our students have a real authentic university experience. We have learned a lot and adapted 
very, very quickly in the past year. And I think what we have got coming out of that is a very uh, well-defined blend of interactive teaching, online teaching, uh, pre-recorded teaching, and then the whole social and support environment also that's in place. We are, um, have already opened up a lot of our facilities in the university already. So the libraries are open, the graduate school is open, cafes are open. So we're already moving back towards that full campus experience. And we would uh, anticipate that by September, we will have moved still further down that path, assuming mm -hmm. all goes well, as we all hope it will. Um, we, by September, we would hope to have a significant amount of face-to-face -face teaching. Um, as I said, our support services are already in place. And really what we have done across all of our modules, and this really is a constantly changing situation. Every week, the university's executive discusses how do we adapt, what do we do, how do we prepare for the next step. So it is constantly changing in response to the current situation. But what we are doing at the moment is every single learning outcome for every single module, we're looking at how do we make sure that that is achieved through the ideal balance of interactive, um, pre-recorded and face-to-face -face. but all through the pandemic we have made sure that our students have access to one-to-one uh, -one support from their tutors and from colleagues in the graduate school elsewhere so that's there for the teaching environment in terms of just safety on campus again very well defined we have um, free testing for all of our students and staff that's going on at the moment in our one of our major venues so any staff who are on campus at the moment are being tested twice a week students can do the same uh, very clear guidance in place for the numbers of students who can be in rooms at a time uh, for sanitizing for m use of masks and so on mm -hmm. so i think we can be very confident that our students are already getting back to a very very rich experience and that that will be still better by the time we get to september okay and just one final one for you margaret I'm a student from the Republic of Ireland. How will Brexit affect the fees that I will be paying for postgraduate study? Yeah. So Brexit, the gift that keeps giving, no surprises on my views on Brexit. What we do have absolute certainty on is for students who are starting in 21-22, uh, so this coming academic year in a master's course or a, a PhD is that our Department for the Economy has confirmed that a Republic of Ireland or any other EU student will be treated as a home student for the purposes of their fees, for the purposes of access to tuition, loans and maintenance support. Beyond 2021 start, we don't know. We will know as, as time goes on. But for 2021 to 22 start, you absolutely will be treated as a, as a home student. So that means you're paying the home fee. The standard home fee on our master's programmes at the moment for uh, Northern Ireland, so EU and ROI, is £6,450. Um, slightly higher for GB students, but we can provide details for that in, in the sessions afterwards. Um, so as an ROI student, you will be able to have access to um, a loan from the Republic of Ireland government uh, over, over €6,000, which will help support your PGT programme. Um, home students in Northern Ireland have access to a loan for, to support tuition fees from our Department of the Economy of £5,500. And students domiciled in England also have access to loans to support their postgraduate taught and research programmes of over £10,000. So basically start in 21, 22, because beyond that, who knows? But <laughs> Margaret, that's for 2021, 20, 22, you'll be treated as a home student. That's great. Very comprehensive. Thank you very much. And we are going to be having some postgraduate student currently studying at Queen's joining us very shortly. So stay with us for that. Before I let our wonderful guests go here, I'm going to go around and ask each of you, if you were to choose a postgraduate course outside of your own faculty, what would you like to do? David? Oh, Good question. Um, I suppose given, given everything that's gone on in the last year and, and the, the role in digital education and how we've been developing that, I think I might actually choose one of Dahi's courses in post-visual uh, post production and, 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 and creative, creative communication. Brilliant. Karen? go for something creative again because I've been embedded in science and science with clinical focus for years in my career. I like music, I like composing music, and I'd like to know how to do that better. And I would like um, to do something so that people could remember me as the next Rachmaninoff. <laughs> Let's aim high. Absolutely. There's <laughs> nothing stopping you, Karen. <laughs> what about you, Dahi? Well, I teach on a programme in law and technology, and that's given me the great privilege to meet some students who are doing the Masters in Applied Cyber Security, which sounds like the most fascinating programme, so I would love to go and join them on that. Helen? 
It would be remiss of me if I didn't say a programme that involves something to do with French and literature. <laughs> <laughs> and then you could find out for yourself what yes, it is that Margaret indeed. does. So she had to say that. <laughs> ten out of ten again. Margaret. <laughs> So I, I, I'm absolutely embedded in the arts throughout my entire career. So I think I'm going to do one of our conversion courses and do our uh, MSc in software development because even someone with a background in French st studies can do software development and then I can continue to stay in my pyjamas all day. <laughs> Sounds brilliant. Thank you all so much indeed for joining us today. And as I say, we're going to have the postgraduate students joining us very shortly and the faculty staff will be taking questions at one o'clock until two. So any more questions you have, get them into us. Uh, but before all that, we have a very special guest now, one, of, one other former student of Queen's University who they are very proud of indeed. His name is Doni O'Sullivan, who you may have seen on global news channel CNN in recent months. He was reporting from the heart of US politics. And he was at the centre of those protests on Capitol Hill back in January. He has done substantial and significant work in investigative journalism on conspiracy theorists and disinformation in election campaigns. In a recent wide-ranging interview, Doni spoke of his own battles, his own struggles with his mental health and the supports that he received. He is a past student of Queen's. He has a master's degree in political science and he recorded this special message for us all today. My name is Doni O'Sullivan and I was a student at Queen's University Belfast in 2012 and 2013. Uh, I studied legislative studies and practice, which I think is a fancy way for saying uh, politics. The program I did was a joint program that was run by Queen's and by the Northern Irish Assembly uh, at Stormont. We did a four day a week internship up in Stormont for nine months and with night classes and Friday uh, classes at Queen's. I really enjoyed my time at Queen's. I lived uh, in Queen's accommodation in the Elms complex and we had a really good time, made friends there for life. Many of us are still in a WhatsApp group to this day, um, almost 10 years on, it's making me feel a bit old. Um, and there's messages flying in there every day. The support network at Queen's I found to be extremely helpful and very, very important to me. Unfortunately, I suffered from uh, depression and anxiety uh, during my postgraduate study and something I've struggled with since. Uh, but really during uh, my time there uh, was when I first had to sort of confront the problem and the people at Queen's were just so supportive. I was able to get counselling. Uh, my professor, Professor Rick Wilford, was extremely encouraging and basically every sort of support was available at Queen's, which um, without it I, I wouldn't have been able to, to complete my Masters. I am now a reporter working for CNN in New York City. I think I learned a lot uh, during my time at Queen's and my postgraduate that I use today. Certainly a lot of the research and analytical skills, but also talking to people, talking to people from different backgrounds. The beauty of studying politics in Northern Ireland is, is sort of how people um, from very different backgrounds and very different sets of beliefs are living together and are working together and are in politics together. There was a really good atmosphere at the university. The library is beautiful. Um, just the campus is great. And, and Belfast is a really fun place. There's many places you can study politics in the world, but I would certainly put Queen's University Belfast up there as one of the best places to go. Kerry man, Doni O'Sullivan, working now for CNN in the United States, absolutely thriving in his work, past student of Queen's University. Well, we are joined now by three current postgraduate students. Ethna O'Brien is from the Republic of Ireland. She is studying for a master's in city planning and design. Neve McGookin is from Northern Ireland and is studying for a PhD in medicine. And Shing Him Mack is an international student studying law. You're all very welcome. Thanks for being with Thank us. You. Ethna, I'll start with you because you did your undergraduate study at DCU, Dublin City University. You're doing your postgrad here at Queen's. 
why did you pick Queen's? So uh, I had been looking for a change in career and wanted to move into a different field of study. Um, I had known someone that had studied an undergrad at Queen's and had spoke very highly of the university. And just given the broad range of uh, postgraduate um, degrees on offer at Queen's, I was able to find something very specific to my interests. So you're doing a master's in city planning and design. What does that involve? So uh, we learn about the natural and built environment and the challenges that uh, they often face. So uh, the course teaches you, teaches you how to analyse and develop solutions to overcome these problems. Okay, and, and how do you do that? What's involved in that So um, I guess it's a very hands-on course. It's, uh, it's project-led, so we'd work on a lot of uh, real life uh, projects uh, for different clients across Northern Ireland. Um, so we've uh, looked at uh, developing urban regeneration strategies across Belfast and I'm currently working on a new design strategy for a town in just outside of Belfast as well. Mm -hmm. And are there opportunities, Ethna, to work with employers? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of the teaching and the lectures would include um, employers in their, in their lectures and in the module work. And then from, from that, you can actually uh, do a work-based study as part of your thesis or dissertation. So I think there is a fantastic opportunity to develop connections with the working world through, through Queen's and postgraduate school. And what do you hope to do at the end? So I would like to combine my postgraduate degree with my undergrad in communications and I guess um, apply that within the field of urban design and planning. Sounds great. We'll Thank keep you. an eye out for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, Shing, what about you? You're doing a, a master's in law. Yes. Tell us about that. So I'm doing an LLM international business law with placement. So the, uh, the objective of this uh, LLM program is to set the regulatory regimes um, on the global economy uh, in the broader social legal study skills. And one of the special things about my programme is that um, it has an in placement opportunity in it. And uh, that's one of the, the attractive points that, I, um, that, that, that makes me apply to Queen's uh, mm -hmm. because I can gain practical experience in the legal practice before I actually go into the legal practice. Well, I was going to ask you, you could have chosen anywhere in the world. Now, you did your undergraduate degree at Queen's, yes. but you could have gone anywhere to do yes. your postgrad. So why stay with Queen's? So Queen's is actually the only Russell Group universities in the UK that offers a... Um, an LLM program with the inbuilt placement elements in it, and it is definitely one of the uh, major reasons that I apply for it. And the second reason is that I, I actually got a scholarship with Queen's uh, that covers my tuition fees, and that uh, and it, it is um, That's really a big attractive. Yeah. Absolutely, Neve, you are studying for a PhD in medicine. Now, what specifically are you doing? Yes, so my PhD is based in the Centre for Public Health here in Belfast, and I am doing cancer epidemiology work with um, cancer risk with some pr prescription medications. Um, yeah, and that's ba based here in Belfast. Okay, and how exciting is that? It's very exciting to be working in a, a centre for public health during this time, and um, yeah. <laughs> what, what is involved? So mine is mostly computer-based, so I have moved away from uh, my lab-based undergraduate and used my master's as sort of a stepping stone um, to now work in a more statistics-based um, cancer risk setting. Okay, and do you have links with um, employers outside of Queen's when you're doing this work? Yes, so Queen's often puts on seminars um, and courses where you can collaborate with people all over the world um, and the online setting has actually aided that, I think, um, in my opinion. What do you hope to do at the end, Neve? So hopefully with the PhD, that'll give me the experience that I need in a um, public health job uh, here in Northern Ireland, hopefully. Hopefully, I'm sure <laughs> you'll be very successful. Ethna, postgraduate work, is it very different from undergraduate study? Um, yeah, I would say it's definitely a step up and the a postgraduate degree is a lot more specific than what you'd learn at undergrad level. but. Um, within Queen's there are a lot of workshops that they hold as part of the postgraduate school and that's been very helpful for me as someone who's been out of university a couple of years and having decided to come back I've found some of their workshops in 
academic writing and learning how to reference, very helpful and it's gotten me back into the swing of things again. Great. And Shing, what would you say to our students who are watching today who would wonder perhaps is the workload very different from it is in, in an undergraduate degree? I would say so. Um, postgraduate law is very different from an undergraduate law because um, it requires, uh, because th they know you do well in law already, so they would teach you a lot of complex legal theories and cases, and you really have to uh, do all your readings and uh, develop a critical mind uh, in whatever legal issues that you're dealing with. So uh, it's a new skill, uh, but also an essential skill to be an excellent lawyer in legal practice. What about the pandemic, Neve? Has it had a big impact on how you do your work? Um, Yes, in a certain sense that now I'm working from home most of the time. So I've set up my own home office and communication is all via Teams, uh, Microsoft Teams, uh, through video calls. And I think that was a big change for me, but I think it has come with its benefits mm. in that you can do a lot more online um, because you don't actually have to travel places. Um, and there's a lot more things that you can do. It's more efficient. It's more efficient, ways, yeah. yeah. What's mm -hmm. Belfast like? Do you like it, Ethna? Yeah, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. It's, it's a very accessible city and it's really affordable. And, you know, you've kind of a mix of urban and rural uh, within the city and you're very close to a lot of attractions across the north of Ireland. So I'm really enjoying it so far. Great. Well, look, thank you all so much indeed for joining us and telling us uh, your experience of postgraduate study here at Queen's University and life in Belfast. So are many of you tempted to do your postgraduate work here at Queen's? Well, it is indeed very attractive. And as Ethna was saying, Belfast is a great city. It's very vibrant and it is truly international. If you didn't get to ask your question today or if you've thought of another one, don't worry. The uh, facilitators, the support services, the faculty staff, they are all standing by to take more questions from you and they'll do that up until two o'clock today. So thank you again. Good luck with your future careers, with your future choice of studies, and hopefully things will be much better next year when we'll be able to meet in person. Bye for now.